Hello, welcome to the Capitalist Sage Podcast. We're here to bring you advice and tips from seasoned pros and experts to help you with improving your business. I'm Carl Barham with Transworld Business Advisors, and my co-host is Rico Figliolini with Mighty Rockets Digital Entertainment and the publisher of the Petri Corners Magazine. Rico, how are you doing today? Good, Carl. Hope you're well. Hope everyone's staying uh, socially safe. We are, we are, we are adapting to the new world um, order and um, doing the best we can to help get through this. Why don't you talk today a little bit about our sponsors? Sure. So I want to introduce one of our sponsors, a key sponsor actually, is Hargrave Fiber. They've been a uh, big player here in Peachtree Corners and actually in the Southeast. So they've been um, in a lot of different cities like Lawrenceville and um, and it, through the south of uh, Georgia as well. They, they provide fiber optics to the business community, as well as the consumer part, but the business community is really where they're at. And as you can imagine now with everyone teleworking, this is a really big deal, which goes back to our guest today as well. But I want everyone to be aware that, you know, visit hargravefiber.com, find out about what they can do, what services they can provide you out fiber optic services and also about their uh, promotion they're running right now which is free business internet for the next 90 days so visit hargravefiber.com slash business and you'll be able to uh, see that and maybe take advantage of that who would have thought that the investments we've made over the last 30 40 years on fiber optics and internet capability is going to become so relevant yeah. um in yeah. today and and as we're making this grand shift into um, a different remote technology-driven workforce in a way that we haven't um, seen done almost ever, um, I'm really glad to have today's guest. Uh, David Husanica is the CEO of Rogely Services, a Petri Corner-based IT and cloud service partner providing um, collaboration as well as cloud hosting, helping businesses with business continuity and office management services, for both small and medium-sized business. How are you doing today, David? I'm doing wonderful, Carl. How are you? Great, great. Well, today we want all these playing a place, um, taking, um, having a role in what's going on today. Um, in massive droves, people are moving to working at home as we are, are following the CDC guidelines and government guidelines for social distancing. But I got to imagine doing that um, is bringing up challenges that small businesses and, and employees may not have thought of when they were thinking that they have to do a lot of their jobs from home. And I just wanted to, to spend some time exploring that with you today. That sounds great. Um, so what, why don't you start off with uh, just tell me a little bit about yourself and and how do you get into this 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 business? Well, um, my background has been in uh, IT and software and technology for 30 years. And really kind of where we landed in this business today is, um, you know, years ago when cloud first started emerging, uh, we really felt like it was a, a game changer and it was going to redefine the way that technology is used and deployed in businesses. And so we were uh, early adopters of trying to learn, you know, how to leverage the technology, how to leverage it for, business purposes. And, uh, you know, it turned out to be a great bet because uh, here we are today where, you know, it's almost impossible to think about, you know, running a company uh, and doing the things that we do without leveraging, you know, cloud technology. Yeah. I mean, from the, the you know, starting off with basic office services, um, I'm seeing more business uh, implement Internet of Things, IoT strategies. So, being able to have manage data flow, security, all these things has become a really important business consideration for, for a lot of folks. So um, maybe you could tell me a little bit, of, you know, since this has been happening, what are some, some of the things you're seeing your clients, small businesses having to grapple with? And what are some of the things they're doing that, that are, you know, helping to manage this situation? Sure. Sure. And uh, if you don't mind, I'd just like to, before I get into that, I'd just like to start off by, you know, offering my thanks and prayers to our nation's frontline workers uh, who are essential in helping us push through this incredible situation. You know, all of us 
have family and friends who, because of our, our needs, must continue to serve the community. Uh, and many times putting themselves in harm's way. And also like to have every, ask everybody to pray for our nation's leaders who are having to make decisions you know, nobody was really prepared for. Um, yeah, the unique situation that companies are finding themselves in, you know, of having to make that transition from a work in office to 100% remote workforce in some cases is, is raised uh, some pretty challenging uh, concerns and um, around technology and how you use it. And I think, uh, you know, if I had to start anywhere, I think I would probably start in the in the realm of uh, security. You know, how do how do you as a company uh, ensure that uh, your uh, the data and the identities and the information that you're needing to now access remotely, you know, is done in a secure fashion, and that uh, we're not you know compromising, you know, information, and uh, so. You know what we're seeing in our in our customers. Uh, first of all, one of our first recommendations is that uh, is to enable things like uh, multi-factor authentication. Um, many of us have seen that in action with uh, with commercial applications that you use, where you go to log into a site and it sends you a text message or you know some other form of multi-factor, and, and that really is probably one of the the low-hanging number one recommendations we can make. For people is to if their if their solutions that they use for business, you know, have multi-factor capability, uh, enable that. Make sure that that is on. Can I ask a question on that? Um, I know on a lot of um, smartphones and different, there most companies are starting to ask that. Why is that so important? What is that doing versus what people conventionally do without um, two-factor author authorization? Yeah. Well, the primary thing is that, you know, it's beyond just a, a user ID and password to where it's a private device that, uh, you know, the good news is so far that's been a protected type of uh, setup to where, you know, people are not able to intercept uh, those feeds. So it's, a, it's another way of authenticating who you are, that your identity is truly who you say you are. And, uh, and so if, you know, if multi-factor is enabled, uh, it's going to communicate with that individual through a, an alternative means. And, uh, and it, again, it just reduces the risk that anybody could access your information, your systems without uh, having the proper authority to do so. Got it. Okay, thanks. Let me, let me ask you another question as well. I've been dealing with um, a couple of different companies that um, – have all sorts of things going on right now. We've had to reset passwords on emails sometimes because mm -hmm. they're clicking on the wrong things. Uh, all of a sudden, they're getting, getting a SharePoint email that's not really from SharePoint. They think it's a document. Uh, they think it's an ad contract, let's say, on a contract because they're salespeople. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Bless you. Bless you. They're looking at, uh, you know, they want to get that sale. It's a, that type of environment. So everyone's mm -hmm. like, just clicking on things. It's just like, stop, stop doing that. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with that? What are you seeing out in the community when it comes to sales or operations of that sort remotely? Yeah, that, that's a, you know, the, the, the bad actors out there are seizing this opportunity. Uh, you, you know, even in good times, they're at you all the time with these phishing emails, phishing attacks, trying to get you uh, to click on something, you know, and, and it's, unfortunately it's even heightened in times like this. And so, you know, the, the recommendations that, that we have to avoid that, first of all, you know, if you weren't expecting that, that communication, mm -hmm. then, you know, you need to double and triple verify that it's, it's correct. And, and uh, you know, the good old fashioned techniques of, you know, picking up the phone and calling somebody to verify, hey, Rico, did you just send this to me? You know, are are is is really a great way of uh, circumventing, you know, acting on something that is a scam. Um, you know, we get these emails all the times about you know, click on here to download a document or change your password. Right. Um, I would say don't ever click on the links that are in the email. Go to the website. So, for instance, if uh, if a service says that your password has expired, right, rather than you know, uh, resetting it from the email, go to that service's website, 
and log in that way and see if it needs to be reset that way. Yeah, well, that would make sense to me because if they're going to send you an email, you probably have notification on the site itself. Mm -hmm. You want to be able to get caught the wrong way. What about yeah. communications um, via like a VPN versus um, doing it on, you know, so some, some people think it's too slow working on VPN. They just take things onto their their own desktop or their own laptop, and then they bring it back up into someone's server. Mm -hmm. What do you think about the workflow when it comes to that that type of thing? You know, having having remote access to files is you know vitally important for all of us in this mode. So, you know, having a secure way of getting to those files, and there's multiple technology strategies that you can deploy to have that access. You know, VPN access into a file server on the on the network, you know, is one method. Right. Uh, you know, in, in, at the speed at this whole condition fell upon us, uh, you know, not every employee was set up for VPN access from home. Right. And, and so that has become, you know, a, a, a gap that many companies have been trying to fill in. Um, but the fundamental uh, guidance on that is, is that if you can avoid downloading, modifying and uploading, it's, it's better that way. Uh, if you have direct access to the files, either through a VPN or if you're logging in through like an Office 365, SharePoint, OneDrive, which uh, having two factor enabled, right? So that you're having to do multi-factor, uh, you know, in order to be able to get in and access those files, um, you know, uh, that is absolutely the, the preferred ways of doing it versus the uploading and downloading. You've had a, a company that, uh, one of the companies that I think locally here in Peace Corn is that you help set up their they work remotely. Mm -hmm. Is there any special challenges to that? Uh, p setting people's home office infrastructure maybe up or yeah. anything along those lines? Well, there are challenges and, you know, uh, again, the speed that this came on us, not everybody was set up the same way. So, you know, the, as far as home office, first of all, our recommendation is if you know, if you can avoid using your home computer to access corporate data, you should do that. And, and the reason being is that if it's a corporate device that you're using, chances are it's been set up a certain way there. You know, you know, many IT organizations are pretty diligent and making sure that, you know, the, the most up to date versions of all the operating systems are in play, that the most up to date versions of antivirus are, are loaded and active. And those are all things that you know traditionally will take place and in, in ahead of time and and so using a, a, a corporate device is, is is certainly typically more secure if you don't have that ability uh, then you know you need to you need to consider doing those same things for your home device meaning you know we all we're all guilty of it we delay that that windows update or that uh, office update or you know that antivirus update uh, I'd, I'd suggest you, you don't do that. Go ahead and make sure everything is current. Uh, make sure, you know, you have the latest and greatest uh, for that. And, and, and so that will certainly go a long way in helping protecting the underlying, you know, condition of, of the machine. When you, I know a lot of people, they, they become complacent when it comes to those types of things because corporate IT department automates so much of it. Now you get more disconnected uh, and let's say someone worked for a smaller company where they don't have a corporate ID. Um, what can they do to help themselves secure their devices? And well, computers? yeah. So a couple of things that we've already mentioned is, uh, you know, uh, ensuring that multi-factor is enabled, whatever you're doing, um, making sure that the uh, office, you know, the, um, the windows or a Mac or whatever OS is, is updated and is current at the current levels and all the patches are applied. Um, making sure that uh, you, the network, the uh, wireless that you're accessing is a secure wireless network uh, that, is, that requires you know, secure authorization to get to it. Um, can, I, can I ask on that point, for example, that's one of the areas where most people on their home network, um, they get it installed and I don't know that they've checked it, are there, what can they look for to know that their home, what would you look for to check if a home network was secure? Yeah, so it, the signal that, uh, that you'll receive will indicate whether or not it's uh, 
things like uh, WAP or WEP or you know enabled, which means that you have security turned on for that connection, um, and 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 making sure that you've got a strong you know password uh, if you're going to get onto the wireless. You know, don't let it be your phone number, don't let it be you know other things that are easily you know, determined uh, by people outside of your, your, your home office, you know, so your neighbors or, you know, literally somebody's parked on the street in front of your home could potentially jump on your Wi-Fi network and, and get access to, you know, any other device that happens to be on that, including, the, you know, uh, uh, the one that you're on. So, you know, um, and, and, you know, each of the uh, wireless systems have slightly different uh, things as far as how you configure it, but uh, just making sure that it's a secure uh, password protection uh, connection that you're you're accessing. I've got a follow on question uh, along that line as many, especially smaller business freelancers, they use um, a lot of cloud sharing devices. You've got Google Drive, Dropbox, all these different brands. Are those are those okay for folks to use um, for 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 securing documents? And I know there are different layers of security. Or what are some things they should be particularly cautious about when using those? Well, the, you know, again, secure uh, file share and access to files remotely are, is vitally important. And, and there's a number of different brands out there. There's some of the ones that you mentioned. You know, are, are very good solutions. We we uh, we're a very strong uh, proponent of uh, Microsoft Teams and SharePoint and on uh, OneDrive, uh, just because uh, we're you know it's it's a, it's the the security around that has evolved to be where it is enterprise grade security that they have surrounding those. Not that you know those other solutions don't have some levels of security, but uh, what I would suggest is that you know is uh, come up with a standard for the organization. Uh, I would I would say you know you be much better off as an organization in the mode that we're in today of saying hey for our remote files access or sharing if you don't have another solutions we're gonna we're gonna standardize on X and we're, we want everybody to use X uh, because whenever you have two three four different applications that are being used by uh, employees um, first of all you, you know ensuring the consistency of the security around those is very difficult and uh, and also uh, ensuring that you know corporate data is not being shared uh, to people outside of the business in a fashion that's going to violate you know corporate uh, standards or, or uh, compliance standards so by having settling on a single platform you know that that will help you ensure that there is some levels of control because then you can begin to build in things like uh, uh, role-based permissions. So if you and I, uh, you know, we might have access to the same uh, SharePoint site, for instance, but we are able to control that the files that you can access versus what I can access based on our role in the company. And that certainly you know, goes a long ways in helping making sure that you know, people aren't themselves viewing or sharing you know, to outside uh, people information that should not be shared. Well, if I could shift a little bit and just start understanding more, um, if, if you were to help someone, and, and I know many friends have set up home offices, um, when you start thinking about hardware and infrastructure and doing that and some of the things that you've seen people utilize effectively, um, are there things that you'd recommend for someone to make sure they put in place? Uh so, you know, hardware, um, you know, there's a lot of great brands of hardware. I, I would certainly stick with some of the some of the better known brands um, from a hardware standpoint. You know, you know, from a configuration standpoint, if you're able to, you know, for instance, my machine here, I'm home office, but, you know, I'm not on my uh, Wi-Fi. I'm directly connected into my router via via cable. So even, you know, you do have the ability to. Uh, to do things linked up, you know, via cable versus always Wi-Fi, and so that that would be something to consider. And, and a lot of times it has to do with, uh, you know, where is the, the router coming into your home office located in comparison to where your computer is. Uh, but can, you know, can I can I ask you a question along that? Yeah. Um, so you just described something. I remember when 
Wi-Fi wasn't as, as prevalent as it is today, and people would have direct Cat5 cable into their server. Are, is that a more secure method? If you are really concerned, you're a financial professional or healthcare, and you have some really high level, it could it would be in hardware to allow you to direct line into your server be a, a worthwhile consideration? Absolutely. Absolutely. It just takes one more, uh, one more layer out of the equation of how, the, you know, what data is flowing through. And, and so if you're not having everything is not going through your home office Wi-Fi, which again can be uh, potentially hacked, you know, if people have the credentials or are sitting outside or other things, you know, it just removes another layer from the equation. Okay. How are you uh, dealing with clients also that have to do like real time collaboration? Um, you know, dealing with uh, you have people out there on Zoom. I mean, that's not the only product you can use. Obviously, we're using something else. Mm -hmm. Although this is not meant uh, for that type of collaboration. This is meant more for broadcast. But how are you dealing with that? I mean, are you finding it easier for people to deal with it? Are you finding it becoming something that may become the norm after this? I think it, I think there's some silver lining to this dark cloud is that some of the processes that we're, we're having to use today will have real benefits long term. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you had mentioned one of our clients that we've helped enable uh, from a, a remote workforce standpoint. This is a you know software development company that was high on collaboration. I mean, literally, they were doing huddle meetings, you know, all day long, looking at code together. Uh, uh, can, you know, having meetings uh, on site and with remote personnel. And so uh, that's a that's a scenario where we were able to deploy with them a uh, product. And this is, again, the Microsoft solution, Microsoft Teams, which includes all the tools under one platform that allows them to do that. So they can do, you know, chats, uh, real-time chats back and forth. You can do uh, voice calls between each other. You can do video conferencing like we're doing here. Uh, has a uh, uh, file sharing, uh, secure file sharing, so you can store your files and have access to it. And you can, you know, do do all the things that a highly collaborative environment really needs. And you get it all underneath one brand or one label. And you know, I'm not saying that's the only one out there. I'm just saying that is one that we have deployed not only for those folks, but uh, time and time again, we have. I think across the board, we've got about 175 companies that we work with, customers, and I'd say 75% uh, of them, 80% of them have deployed a solution like that. Um, and, and the good news is many of them that were already, you know, somewhere down that road before this this hit, which gave them really a leg up and being able to uh, be able to respond to this as quick as possible. So I have an interesting insight in that uh, I worked for a lot of years in large corporations. And so Microsoft Teams and some of these um, tools and available. When I talk to small business owners, a lot less of them are familiar. So you've used a couple of terms. Can you describe, for instance, what would be um, in the tool belt of someone new to collaboration that might be there? So like the example, what exactly is Microsoft Teams and what does that do? And are there, are there one or two other tools like that you think people may want to get familiar with? Yeah. So what Microsoft Teams is is really Microsoft's collaboration. It's a platform that is comprised of multiple pieces, multiple uh, solutions. So you know it allows uh, you and I right now, even though we're looking at each other through the video, we could be chatting with each other offline. Uh, so I, I, you know, and that's great for, if I just need an answer from Rico, I don't want to necessarily have to call them or wait for an email response. I can, I can see that Rico's online. Uh, I can ask a question, get an answer right away. So that, that real time chat capability is, is, is that kind of like texting for somebody for an that would be used for immediate yeah. response. You throw out a question and anyone on that chat can respond back quickly. Exactly. So you could do one on one, you could have groups. And so a way of, uh, you know, again, collaborating, getting real time, you know, answers very quickly uh, versus having to, you know, in, in an email mode, you send it, but you don't know if the, if the person's there or not. And this this gives you that presence capability. 
You know, I want to ask you something because I, I work here in my teleworking out of my own office. My dining room is right there. My son, my high school kid, is on a dining room table with his laptop doing his work. And I feel like we're all in a big uh, fraternity house or something, <laughs> all at home doing work. Uh, but when I pass by his, his laptop sometimes and I talk to him about what he's doing, I see this younger generation, not only is he doing the digital learning in their portal environment, but he also is, has Discord open, which is one of these chat type places, right? That you mm -hmm. can communicate with your, your friends. It's mainly used for gaming and other things. Um, do you find any intergenerational, generational issues with people getting online and being able to do the work? Do you see any challenges there from, from your point of view? Well, you know, the younger generation, uh, the, you know, the millennials and around the millennial, I mean, they certainly are more adept to these types of tools than maybe some of us older folks are. I put myself in, in the older folks category. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's, it really is something they grew up with. Um, and it's something, you know, uh, my, my, my parents now are finally texting, uh, but it's, you know, here we are in year 2000 and 20 and you know it's just taking a long time for them to get to that point so you know the younger generation grew up in a fashion where they're uh they they've had these immediate communication protocols that they've been able to leverage whether it's be texting or or chatting and you know you know a lot of this did come out of the gaming environment to where right. you know, they, they they did this way before businesses you yep. know really adopted these uh these solutions and yeah. the and I see it creeping into business sometimes, too, because some younger employees don't want to be on the video camera. They'd rather just be, you know, do the audio, mm -hmm. uh, you know, but of course, the the upper management wants to see everyone on video because it's one way of keeping in touch and one on one and all that. Yeah. And I think there's some, there's definitely some value in, in doing that. I mean, like, for instance, in our, our company, we have a daily all hands meeting okay. and uh, and, you know, when this all all came about, you know, we were we would all be in a conference room together looking at each other. And then all of a sudden, you know, this cloud came over us. And and now, you know, uh, we began those where we were just, you know, voice only. But we began to turn on our videos, too, as a way of, you know, particularly in the mode that we're in, giving people that extra you know, social capability of, you know, I can show you something in my office if I need to or pick up a, uh, you know, so. Uh, you know, I think I think that's good. And, and the good news is these platforms like, um, you know, Microsoft Teams and there's others, you know, they they allow you that 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 extended level of collaboration. It could go from chat to voice to video to, you know, you and I can be uh, sharing a document right now. And, and both of us working on that exact same document at the exact same time versus me having to, you know, do my work and then say, okay, Rico, take it over here. It's yours now. And then you have to do your work and then we have to figure out who did what. So, right. so you sure. know, these, these platforms have really accelerated that whole collaboration and it gives you a, a options as to what's the best way to do it for, for that need and that team. Yeah. So we've got a couple of others you've mentioned and discussed chat as a tool. Um, you talked about file sharing and in that example with Rico, where you could do live updates or two more more than one person could do that. What's the tool that that facilitates that kind of file sharing? Yeah, so uh, that kind of file sharing is baked into uh, SharePoint and OneDrive, as an example. And uh, what the, what people the term for that is co-authoring. And and so when you look at you know being remote, trying to work with multiple people at the same time. You know, that, that's a that's a feature that, you know, whatever platform you go to, you should probably uh, consider, does it have that co-authoring capability? So, uh, you know, and what that does is it, it, it basically gets you out of this uh, serial mode where, you know, I've got to do my work and then then you can do your work and then Alice can do her work. And, and so, you know, this allows all three of us to be in the exact same document so we could have a Word document, Excel sheet open at the same time and I could see where you're working and as you as you're typing and you're making updates uh, those would show up on mine and I, I'm working in a different area of the document or the different part of the Excel sheet so you know it just uh, greatly enhances that whole collaboration experience so so I've got two 
is this video co collaboration. I've seen more s Skype, um, Zoom, GoToMeetings, all of these platforms people using, some well, some not so well. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about platforms for that and, 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 and some things that people can do to be to use those effectively. What's the use case for that? Well, um, first of all, you know, there's a lot of good good ones that are out there. The ones that you mentioned, you know, um, you know, have have strong followings. Um, you know, again, Microsoft Teams has that built into it. So that's the one that we standardize on. But the most important thing, I believe, is that, you know, people have to get comfortable with how to use the tool. Um, you know, there's you know, there might have been 10 percent instance, of your company prior to a month ago that ever started and managed a video meeting, you know, web conference meeting, screen share, chat, voice, video, Might maybe 10 percent. Now that that 10 percent has gone to maybe 75 percent of your company needs to know how to do that. And and so that that other percentage is needs to be trained or maybe people need to be retrained. And, and, and actually how to use it effectively. And so that they are, you know, able to conduct the meetings and collaborate the way that you want them to. So there's a, there's a secondary on that, follow on that. So in the video, I've, I've noticed people struggling with um, video that's doing a lot of demand on bandwidth mm -hmm. versus what they might've done before. Are there tips and things that people can do to be able to, conduct more of these meetings. Imagine four people in a household all doing a video meeting today because the husband, the wife, and both kids are all on some form of video. Mm -hmm. What can you do or what are some of the tips you might have for someone to be able to manage that? Or should they all be on it? Should they should they change different resolutions? Any thoughts? Well, um, you know, a lot of it has to do with the bandwidth, with, you know, starting from the street coming into the house. So if you, depending on the carrier that you have, you might have certain bandwidth that there that you've signed up for, you know, whether it be, you know, Hargrave or whether it be a Comcast or something like that. So, you know, that will certainly impact uh, how many of those types of things you're able to do concurrently. Um, then you have, you know, uh, capability within the four walls, such as, you know your your uh, your Wi-Fi and and the type of uh, you know bandwidth that that has and capability. Um, you know you need to also people need to have diligence. As a matter of fact, you know before this call, uh, my daughter's upstairs doing her uh, homework, which has a, a lot of video, and so I just asked her. I said, "Hey, I'm going to be on an uh, important meeting here. Can you just hold off streaming for a little bit in the event that it does collide?" Uh, but, you know, the reality is you're probably not going to know if four people can do it at once until you try it once or twice. And and you may want to try that in a, in a mode to where it's not going to disrupt, you know, um, uh, the other people. And which is one of the advices we give people is that, hey, if you're going to start using things like web, web conferencing and video conferencing and, and all that is is try it out ahead of time, you know, get on it. Get somebody you know, comfortable, a friend, a family member, you know, with you. Make sure that the quality is there because you might have to make some adjustments either for your own home office uh, technology or you may need to call your uh, provider and say, hey, I need to go from 100 meg to a gig type of uh, bandwidth. You know, it's interesting because the um, your Zoom, for example, is throttling a little bit on how they are streaming the video, too. So they've depending on your membership with them or your package with them, you might be only doing it at 760 or something like that versus something higher. Mm -hmm. I don't know about, you know, you all, but like, for example, in my house, we have, I think we have a 250 package. It's like whatever the fastest package is we have. And I have four or five people online all the time doing stuff. Mm -hmm. And yesterday, 2,500 people through Comcast Xfinity went out. And we were out for an hour and a half. So everyone comes down to see me to say, because <laughs> I'm the IT guy, to say, what's going on? And I'm like, it's out, 2,500 people in Peachtree Corners. There's a spot somewhere. It shows it on the map. Mm -hmm. But everyone has the, you know, the data plane we have on our tablets and the cell phones. Yeah. 
hot spot it. That's what we did for that hour and a half. We yeah. hot spotted the stuff. Like, granted, some of it could be low bandwidth, but there's ways around some of that. I think. Yeah, that's a great point, Rico. And you know, having an alternative, you know, is, is certainly something I always want to you know keep in the back of your mind. Is that you know, what if this does break down? What am I going to do next? Right. Uh, it was just like like in the old days, whenever you're doing, uh, you know, uh, and many people on this call probably don't remember, but you had the uh, the projector where you put the transparency on, you know, right. uh, in the meetings, and you know, and and so okay, what if the what if the bulb on that projector went out during your meeting? You know, how are you going to continue? You know, so <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that's where you say, well, I also brought a hard copy that we can all. Right. pass around and and go off of you know so they're they're you know thinking through it a little bit certainly helps in making sure that we're you know, there's right. one thing along that line just the difference between how much data video uses versus audio yeah um, a lot of times if everyone is streaming netflix um running um, um meetings video meetings there might be times where the right application is just an audio yeah but you can almost you can be lull into videoing everything and you're throttling bandwidth when you know for a period of time you might say look maybe you go on audio only and you stop streaming the video and then you know if you have a bandwidth problem you can toggle some of that stuff yeah that's right and you know some of these tools do have the ability to where you can you can choose to accept video as well as broadcast video so, and you can either or those. So, you know, being mindful that, you know, video is going to eat more bandwidth. There's just no two ways about it. And you, uh, mentioned, you also mentioned different plans. So uh, I, I'm not familiar with all of them in particular, but um, you know, the, the giga and the, how much bandwidth in this, in this next 60 day period with all the homeschooling and other things that are going on, what what types of, of bandwidth do you think people would be safe at with if they had? Just so they have an idea if they're way below and they may need to be investigating their talking with their providers. Yeah. You know, each case is going to be different, but I would say um, as much as you can get is is the easy answer, you know. But you know, uh, we uh, what we did personally in, in our house is we were, I think, at about a two hundred uh, Meg type of plan with uh, with our provider and knowing that we're all going to be here and also I did some other things with with moving over to uh, streaming TV you know we just said we're going to go up to to a gig uh, bandwidth and you know in the in the increase in cost while you know money is certainly important you know it, it was surprisingly inexpensive to make the jump and and so you know thinking about you know, what is the alternative of, you know, spending an extra, you know, 20 bucks a month for this is, is it the fact that my productivity and I can't do the meetings, I can't do all the work, you know, it, it seems like a, a pretty good trade off. And again, I'm not not minimizing that, you know, money is important, but uh, but so is productivity in these days. So sometimes you have to sacrifice a little bit for the higher productivity. And then the the i know that there, there's a lot more we could talk about and and just wanted to ask if people you know had questions and wanted to reach out to you and and your company how would people get in contact uh, with you yeah so uh again we're we're located right here in uh, peachtree corners in um, technology park and specifically if, if you uh, heard of uh, curiosity labs uh where the one of the tenants in that building um, we have, um, you know, obviously website, uh, www.rojoli.com, uh, and, uh, you know, our phone number and everything is listed on there, or you can just contact us at sales at rojoli.com. Uh, and I'll, I'll just, um, also make mention, you know, with the times that we have today, uh, you know, in the situation going on, we have come up with some, uh, what, what, we, what we're calling them is uh, COVID-19 IT relief packages, which are, you know, services that organizations are faced with right now uh, that, you know, they, they need to adopt and they need to do it as cost effectively as possible. So we're offering a number of different free services, such as migrations to Office 365 for people who need to take advantage of 
you know, that platform and teams and, and uh, uh, disaster recovery solutions and, and some other things. So, uh, so those are, we're trying to do our part as a part of this to uh, help uh, particularly SMBs, which is uh, small, medium sized businesses where we live, you know, get the technology that they need in order to continue running their business and also protect their data, you know, during these uh, trying times. Well, um, I really want to thank you so much for spending um, some time with us because um, I know people are talking about relief packages and people are talking about testing and social distancing, but this this behavior shift that's happening across industry where people are, are, are now working more remotely um, will start to unveil opportunities for people to do bad things um, over computers and network. And just starting to think about it and make sure you harden yourself is, is really important. The pretty tools that you outline, chat features, um, file share features, video software, et cetera, are new tools that we all can start using to maintain productivity at home. And in a lot of cases, this is now how our kids are learning for a few more months. So um, becoming familiar and comfortable with that is going to be really important as we navigate ourselves through this uh, pandemic. So um, we would like to thank David um, for for joining us today and talking about about this. And we we do definitely recommend people take advantage of of some of the the offers his company um, is doing. Majoli Services is right here in Petrie Corners. We're trying to help each other. Businesses are stepping up to provide the tools for people to be successful through this. And I want to thank you and, and what your whole team is doing to help with that. Well, thank you for having me on today and, and um, looking forward to uh, the other side of all this for everybody. Thank you. Amen to that. Well, we want to thank um, 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 again, the community for doing everything they're doing. Um, Rico, I'd say social distancing is being taken serious here in our local communities. Um, if you if you go about, you see people taking it serious, and everyone that's doing that is helping to to make this go quicker and and save lives. So we 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 appreciate that, and the sooner we can get this under control and get back um, to to our normal activities, play and work, um, the better. Um, also, wanted to um, just just mention we're going to continue to do our podcast. Uh, we have guests that's coming in, and, and hopefully the format is working. But um, you could hear us on streaming on your local streaming service, the Capitalist Sage Podcast, as well as we we do post this live on Facebook. Yes. Um, and what's the where, where would they find us online, Rico? Sure. So go to livinginpeacerecorners.com. Um, you can also find the podcasts. Uh, if you go to Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, SoundCloud, any of those platforms, just Google or just search for Capitalist Sage, and you'll see the podcast there. Even if you Google Capitalist Sage, you'll podcast, you'll see it online. It's on YouTube. So this video will be on YouTube as well. So any of those places, you can find it. Awesome. Well, I'm Carl Barn with Transworld Business Advisor of Atlanta Peachtree. Our business advisors are available to help people um, navigate through this. We, we help people with buying and selling businesses, advising them how to increase value. And in this time, just making sure they're able to survive through this, if not thrive in the future. And Rico, I know we have some stuff coming out soon. Sure. sure. In fact, I should say that in the next four or five minutes, I have another podcast we're doing, Peace Tree Corners Life, and I'll have the head of school for Wesleyan with me. We're going to be doing talk about distance learning and going through that. So we'll be sharing this podcast space shortly with that. So, um, but this hit the mailboxes or will hit the mailboxes today and tomorrow, Peace Tree Corners Magazine. You'll find uh, 21 different restaurants you can do your orders from for go-to or curbside pickup. Um, stories on digital learning, local schools, stories on faith, how the churches are reaching out to the communities online through Zoom and other other uh, avenues, and a whole bunch of things like that. As well, if you need any any services when it comes to content marketing or podcast production or anything along those lines, Mighty Rockets is my company, and you're more than happy, you know, more than welcome to contact me. 
Rico, R-I-C-O at MightyRockets.com. Thank you again for everyone for tuning in. Have a great day. Thank you, everyone.